for me in glory and I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angel singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory sing
just want to tell them how much we love them tonight. Amen. How many loves the Lord? Amen. How can I express how much you mean to me? How can I begin to tell of the favor? joy my heart now knows how can I begin to measure love that ever grows how can I then explain what happens when we speak your name Lord how tell me
Hey, folks, the Lord's here tonight. In and out of situations, this tug of war in me. All day long, I struggle for the answers that.
Well, you're a quiet crowd tonight. You know what that means normally. I'm just going to tell you what it means. It means you're tired. Apparently, some of you have had a long week, and I can understand that. And I'm glad the Lord understands it. I mean to tell you, I'm glad he understands it. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, you feel free, if you'd like, to turn to, <clears throat> excuse me, excuse me. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2, and I will also also be looking at Ephesians chapter 4. Now, I want to explain something to you, Lucy, if I may. We've been talking over the last month, or attempting to, about unity in the church. I wish... Tonight, more people were here. I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, not because I want numbers. Not at all. That's, that's not it at all. But the main thing is, I believe that not only um, does the information that the Lord has given me to share with you, <clears throat> not only will it help Westside Baptist Church, but I also believe it will help Families in general, because we're talking about the unity of God's family. <clears throat> but there's also tips or information, if I may say, that will help us in uh, our unity, our getting along with others at work, uh, or even within our, um, our family, not church family, but our uh, moms and dads, aunts and uncles, nieces and nephews, and so forth. So we have something <clears throat> in the Word of God here that, um, well, God's Word is just rounded. Uh, if you can apply it here, nine times out of ten, there, the, it can be implied in a hundred other areas of our daily walk. And so, <clears throat> excuse me again, I don't know why I'm struggling all of a sudden, but I am. But nevertheless, uh, that's... Um, What I want to talk to you about, I want to continue uh, on the subject or with uh, the unity or church unity. And this would be considered the second message, even though it's really the third or the fourth. This just is as far as we've gotten in this study. But as we spoke earlier in the the weeks and even, I believe, in the last month, uh, there's reasons why we ought to have unity. Well, there's obvious reasons, but the three reasons that I've been giving you to jumpstart this conversation um, is we ought to have unity because Jesus Christ prayed for it. And if the Lord thought it was important, then I think we should think it's important. And then also in 1 Corinthians 1, The Apostle Paul pleaded for it. So the Lord prayed for it. A great apostle, he pled for it. And then our last but not least, um, we left off with the Holy Spirit prescribing unity to his people. And so that, I believe, is a pretty airtight reason why we ought to strive for unity uh, among the believers. I I tell you, it's one thing. I I believe that we should strive for unity within the church, and that's that's my main point. But it's okay to get along with everybody. You know that? It's okay to do that. Nothing against it in the Bible. We can get along with everyone. We can even get along with a sinner. We may not be able to accept their sin, and we have to be bold enough to say we love you, but you're living in sin, but we can still tell that to that man or that woman, that boy or that girl, in love. So the Holy Spirit prescribes uh, that we live in unity one with another. Now, Ephesians chapter 4 tells us in verse 1, I therefore, and that's, Turn a few pages to your left, 
from Philippians chapter 2, and you'll be right there at Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> we see here, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation where, wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, when I left off, we did discuss um, the, uh, ha- being uh, lowly or practicing lowliness in our Christian walk. We talked about meekness. We talked about long-suffering, forbearing one another, enduring, holding up one another is what this word means. And we kind of left off right there <clears throat> it says for bearing one another in love and that love thing is very important we talk about it an awful lot but the reason we discuss it is because it's so important because if we love God we'll love people if we love God we'll love his people if we love God we'll love the law so the, the love of God being a part of the ingredient of a Christian walk is imperative for us to be an effective Christian. But then the next part of the verse, in verse 3 says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We discussed this thing of endeavoring. If you remember, we talked about What this word means, it means to be diligent, which is an attitude or a willingness. It means to do diligence, which is to labor, to study, to hasten, to make haste, to exert oneself by command or obligation. It's something that we do because God commanded it. And therefore, as Christians, we are or should feel We are obligated and should feel obligated to do these things. And endeavoring also means this, to give diligence. It changes everything. We go from an attitude to doing uh, or being diligent because of uh, that it's commanded of God and then to give diligence, which is something we do because we love. That's what we do as Christians. We do what we do because we love. You know why I'm here tonight? Because I love the Lord. That's why I'm in his. I'm in God's house because I love the Lord. I love you, but I tell you, I'm here tonight because I love the Lord. I love you, but you alone are not enough to get me to get me here. Uh, I love you, but. My love for you alone does not motivate me to do what I do. It must be the love of God in us. It's something we do because we love God, therefore we love the saints and we love the law. So that's what the Bible means by endeavoring, endeavoring to keep the unity. Now, but here's where I left off and here's where I want to pick up. To keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. That terminology, actually someone came to me and said, well, you didn't mention the bond of peace. They weren't being critical. I'm not criticizing them. I said, well, I didn't get that far, but if you'll come back, we'll get there. (laughs) Well, they're not here tonight. (laughs) Nah, 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 nah. I guess they'll just miss out. I don't know. But they weren't being critical. They were just asking about it. And I want to make that very clear. And neither am I being critical of them. But this terminology, keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That grabbed a hold of me because this thing of the bond of peace is actually defined in the Greek as the ligaments by which the human body or the members of the human body are united together so likewise in the spirit of unity that we are to keep 
it becomes the ligaments, the attachments, that thing which draws together the body of Christ in the spirit of unity. That's what the bond of peace means. So we have to understand the unity of spirit is not just a lighthearted phrase, but it is a deep and it is a deep imperative doctrine that we should adopt as God's children that we can move forward with joy, peace, and the power of God laid upon us. So this thing is deeper than than me getting along with Brother Joe, Brother Joe getting along with me. Now let's move along. We also find that, <clears throat> excuse me, we find here in Ephesians chapter 4, we find in verse 4 through 6, that we have the basis for unity. And the basis for unity is the doctrine of Christ. Look here in verse 4 where it tells us there is, listen to this, Christians. Now, hear me out. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. Now, now hang on to verse 5. Listen now. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Then we slide into verse 6 and it says, One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and ladies and gentlemen, most importantly, I believe, and in you all. The Spirit of God, the one God, the Father of all is in you all. Now, how we choose to obey Him how we choose to use uh, the privilege that he has given us to serve is another thing entirely. But we must understand here that we have a foundation of unity. Now, I want to say this, that there's a group out there, a cult, that tells us that the God that we have today... is not the God of yesterday. That God, the original God, actually died. And now, we serve another God, and when he dies, there will be raised up another God. Now, folks, that's what they teach in the Mormon church. But listen what it says again in verse 4. It doesn't say there's one body at a time. And one spirit at a time, even as ye are caught in the hope of your calling, one Lord at a time, one faith at a time, one baptism at a time, sliding into verse 6, one God at a time, and Father of all, of all at a time, who is above all one at a time, and through all one at a time, And in you all one at a time. That's not what the Bible says. He flat out says there is one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all. And he's above all, has been, is, and always will be through all from the beginning till the end and in you all. That's our God. That's our foundation. And because of this foundation, we can have, if we choose to have, unity of the Spirit and unity within the church. I'm so glad that we serve one God, one time, and that's it. And so this is the foundation of our unity. Uh, I had a young man come to me today. He asked me, he said, he was a new Christian. He said, I'd like to get 
from you some references from the Scripture that deal with eternal security. He said, I tell you, he said, I, I, I have friends and they believe you can lose your salvation. And I, I, I want information <clears throat> so I can counter the doctrine that they're trying to convince me of, which is that you can lose your salvation. So I agreed I would give him uh, that information. This, what we have, is the foundation of unity. <clears throat> And folks, if I didn't believe this, if I didn't believe that there is one body, one spirit, one baptism, one Lord, one faith, one God, one Father of all, if I didn't believe that, if I did not believe that this one, this one that we're reading about in these three verses was strong enough to keep my soul I promise you, I would take my Bible, I would drop it in a trash can, I'd walk out that door, and I'd never enter the church again in my life. This is foundational in so many ways, but tonight we're talking about unity within the church. Then we find in verse 11 through 13 the work of unity. And I'll tell you, I'm going to slip along here for time's sake. The work of unity, you can find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And then also, we can see here that in unity, we must use our talents for unity. What does it tell us this in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11? West side, it says this, If a man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through... <clears throat> Through Jesus Christ. The purpose of our unity, the purpose of our, of our work, the purpose of our ministry, the purpose, ladies and gentlemen, is to glorify Jesus Christ. And what we must ask ourselves this evening, every one of us that are here, is what I am doing in my life, is it glorifying Jesus Christ? Is it benefiting me or is it glorifying Jesus Christ? Am I fulfilled? Am I being fulfilled uh, because of what I'm doing or is it glorifying Jesus Christ? Self-fulfillment is not a reason to do what we do. That's what the world tells you. Well, find something that fulfills you and then do it. Well, I want to tell you, that I'm not against doing something that fulfills you. But that, is, that should not be our motivating factor. According to the Word of God, everything, all things what we do should be the end result to glorify Jesus Christ. And if we are getting some, <clears throat> some self-satisfaction or, or, or some some fulfillment, okay. But first of all, does it glorify Jesus Christ? And if you can be fulfilled and it will glorify Jesus Christ, go for it. But if it's fulfilling you and Jesus Christ is not being lifted up, you've been slipped a Mickey. And you don't have the real thing. You're working for the wrong thing. God or gods. Amen, preacher midget. I'm talking about unity, Christians. I'm talking about unity. If we will work for the purpose of glorifying Jesus Christ, our concerns, our opinions, our... They will all slip by the wayside. We must... According to 1 Peter 4.11, glorify Jesus Christ. Shall I go on? We find in Ephesians 4 and verse 14 something that got a hold of me and I hope it will get a hold of you like it did me. Can I read? 
that henceforth <clears throat> be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every kind of doctrine by the slight or slate of men and cunning craftiness whereby <clears throat> they lie and wait to deceive. Now listen to this. But speaking... <clears throat> But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things. Did you hear what I just heard? God just said <clears throat> two words. Grow up! Grow up! Grow up, Christians, grow up! You know, usually that's a derogatory statement. We get frustrated with someone <clears throat> and we say, Grow up! The other day, it was a man approached a table full of preachers and, and he locked in on, for some reason, on Pastor Payne. And uh, man, he, he was a racist. He was a. Uh, 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 heresiacal dude. He, he called himself a his history major, and yet he could never be more wrong about the church than he, than he is and was that day a few weeks ago. And I got sick and tired of hearing it. I did. I turned and looked at him. I said, it's time for you to go. And he said something to me, and I said, get a job. I did. <laughs> I did. You say, well, what were you doing? I was being, uh, that was a derogatory statement. I was being sarcastic. I was letting him know that he needed to go somewhere else and spread his heresy. And you say, well, why didn't you debate him? A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. And there was no reason for me to waste my time on that clown. But in this way, I, I feel like that maybe we're getting a little sarcasm here when we hear the Lord through his word say, grow up. We all need to grow up a little bit. I don't believe there's a Christian alive today that can't find an area where we could improve upon. Is that right? Or if I may say, an area that maybe we could grow up a little bit in. Well, he goes on to say this. He says this in verse 16. From whom the whole body fitly joined together. That goes back to that ligament thing, remember? The whole body fitly joined together and compacted. So we're talking about the body of Christ being compacted. And I don't believe that is a medical term as we know it, but this medical term or this term means this. God's body, the body of Christ, it means this in compacted, joined or knitted together, to gather, to come to the same opinion. I like that. How do we as a church come to the same opinion? If you've got 100 people, you've got 100 different opinions or variables. So how do we come to the same opinion? We come to the same opinion when we redirect and focus our spiritual lens on doing one thing. That God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 4, verse 11. If we could just stop West Side Baptist Church in our personal lives and say, and say, how today can I glorify Jesus Christ? When you go off to work in the morning, why don't you say, Lord, how can I glorify your name today? I know some of you work in some pretty intimidating environments. 
I remember years ago I worked at Cove for Adams. They're out, I don't think they exist any longer. They were a lumber yard. This was before they had Lowe's and Home Depot and all that. And I tell you, um, the language and the, the uh, subject matter that you'd hear in that uh, type environment with construction workers and contractors and so forth, it, it was pretty nasty. It was, it was a horrible environment. But even in an environment like that, you can say, Lord, help me to glorify your name. You know, instead of getting mad when you hit your finger or, or something aggravates you, instead of cussing like those lost co-workers, just say, praise the Lord. You say, well, isn't that taking God's name in vain? I don't think so. I don't know about you. I'd like to say praise the Lord because in the middle of a bunch of lost people where they're using God's name in vain, you're saying praise the Lord. It's bound to get their attention. In everything that we do, we need to do it to bring what? Glory to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I would say glory to God, which is one and the same. But in our, in our environment that we live in today, you can talk about God, but you can't talk about Jesus Christ. Because God can mean anything. It's a, it has become a generic term. But when you say, praise Jesus, or something good happens, just say, thank you, Jesus. You're going to get somebody's attention. And it's not about giving you the attention, but it's about glorifying Jesus Christ. Glorifying Him. That one that died for you. That one that resurrected for all of us that we could be saved. So glorify Jesus. And I'm going to have to cut, cut it here and, and, and shift some gears. But I, I, I want to end it like this. <clears throat> verse 16 goes on to say about being the compacted body by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love Edifying of itself in love. So here it is. Why ought we have unity? First of all, Jesus prayed for it. Secondly, Paul pled for it. And then thirdly, the Holy Spirit has prescribed it. The most ultimate reason that we should seek unity is what we've seen over the last two Sundays. Last Sunday, a young teenage boy came down and accepted Christ as his Savior. That's why we need unity of the Spirit. Wednesday night, a teenage girl bowed her head and asked Jesus to save her. That is why we need unity of the Spirit. This morning, while we were up here preaching, and ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you, there were two adults in this auditorium that were under so much conviction, they could barely stand still. They needed to be saved. Praise the Lord. But they got the gospel this morning. And while we were giving the gospel here, a 10-year-old boy downstairs was saved. While we were preaching the gospel here, a 12-year-old young man was born again, <laughs> gloriously born again this morning. That's why we we should strive to have unity of the Spirit and unity of the brethren. And this is it, ultimately. I want to read this, and I'm going to be done tonight. This is it, ultimately. Going back to the prayer that Jesus Christ prayed, he said this, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, are in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. Did you hear that? 
he's comparing his relationship, God the Son with God the Father, God the Father with God the Son, and then he's saying this, that so they, can, that so they we, can be one in them, and then he says this, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. That is why. That is why I've been preaching on this thing called unity. Now, <clears throat> Monday I called Steve Brady and I said, hey, just want to make sure you guys got out, got out okay. And There were some things they had to do with the electricity down there and, and just want to make sure everything went okay. And, da-da. <clears throat> and in my conversation with him, he said, Brother Alton, he said, Westside Baptist Church is incredible. He said, brother, you have something special. After service Sunday night, Mrs. Brady told me, we travel all over the country and we don't see this. That is why Satan fights. That is why it's so easy, and I'm including myself in this, <clears throat> for something to happen and me to go from zero, being nice, gentle, and sweet, <clears throat> to a hundred, being the opposite. <clears throat> and I have to remind myself that it's the devil that God wants us to have a spirit of unity here at Westside Baptist Church. And if, if the old devil is going to attack me and cause me to go from zero to 100, from sweet and kind and smiling to ready to choke someone out, he is going to do the same thing to each and every person who, who attends and who works who tries to minister at Westside Baptist Church. I'm no, be- I'm no better, I'm no different than you are. But we must strive for unity. I want to challenge you tonight. I want to challenge you tonight <clears throat> to look around right now. Look around and see those that were here this morning that weren't here tonight. Now, folks, we have a good many people traveling. I get it. I get it. Lisa and I traveled this week and had to get away, and we did. And I just want to say thank you for thank you for behaving while I was gone. <laughs> hey, you think I'm kidding? <clears throat> Am I kidding? A lot of times a pastor goes out of town, and if if the cat knows it, you know what I'm saying. They say with the cat's way. Uh, the, 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 Cast away the mice will play. Well, I, I got to tell you, it, it sometimes, but I didn't get one negative phone call all week long. Not one negative text. <clears throat> Y'all were so happy, so united, <clears throat> and, and it made it really pleasant for Lisa and I to be able to relax, to know that you weren't going to kill one another before we got back in town. But it's the truth. It's the truth. We want God to be glorified in our lives and as a whole, as a church. Get on the phone and say, we missed you. I saw you weren't here. Are you sick? Are you, is somebody that you're with sick? And if they say, no, we just laid out of church, then give them a good scolding in Jesus' name. And tell them you love them, but tell them it's not right. Tell them that this is where they belong. This is where we're to be. When, when it's time for church, Westside, this is where we should be. And it's not, we shouldn't be here just for us. We should be here for what? To glorify Jesus Christ. Can I ask you this? How in the world can I glorify Jesus Christ? How in the world can you glorify Jesus Christ here at your church if you and I are not here? Hello. Unity of the Spirit. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I have really preached my heart out tonight. I got nothing left in me. I've dumped it all right out here for you. I need you. As your pastor, I need you. I need you with a unified spirit. I need you to come in and to be a blessing to me so I'll have enough energy to be a blessing to you. Pastor Payne needs you. He needs you. He's as tired as I am, and he needs you. So I want to tell you, you're needed. I need you. The spirit of unity. Without it, we will not survive. With it, we will shoot upward and onward for the cause of Christ. And I'm asking you to be with me in that endeavor tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to come to you. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to open your word. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the good singing tonight. God, we thank you so much for that young man, that 10-year-old boy, who was saved, gloriously saved. We thank you, Lord, for the 12-year-old boy today that was also gloriously saved. We thank you, Lord, for his mother that was here. Lord, I believe for the first or second time she was here in church. And Father, only you, only you can draw, could draw those young men to you. Only you can draw those, the family of those young men unto yourself. And Father, I pray that you'll use the people that are here tonight to reach out and to get into these families and get the families under the hearing, under the ear of the gospel, oh God, the sound of the gospel, and that they'll also be gloriously saved. Father, help us. Help us, Lord, to strive for the unity of spirit that your word demands of us in Jesus' name. Won't you stand?